In 2017, the Museum of Modern Art, or MoMA, closed its Picasso and Matisse galleries for a renovation. The galleries were home to some of the museum's most famous Picasso and Matisse paintings that are a top tourist destination. In 2018, the Met closed its famous Greek and Roman galleries for a renovation. In both cases, and in other cases just like this, tourists were disappointed that they could not see these famous works when they visited New York City. This, of course, can be tragic for those people. They may have missed their one-in-a-chance lifetime to see these historical works. While tragic, there isn't much that can be done because the restoration work needs to happen. So these works can be preserved for future generations. While tragic, I do think this is an interesting thing to introduce as we pivot to DCS. A thought crossed my mind recently, which is to think of DCS not as a game, but more as a museum. Museums act as institutions to preserve history and make things accessible for the general public to see and to learn. The issue is that museums cannot preserve things that do not exist anymore. So planes or tanks or works of art simply do not survive the test of time. DCS in a way is basically a digital aviation museum by making airplanes available as modules so people can experience them. And just like museums, DCS is not able to show what they do not have. Museums require the actual physical piece and sometimes they just get destroyed over time. DCS can't model everything because of self-imposed requirements to make things full fidelity. This has raised the threshold of what can and can't be made and this means that some of us may never be able to experience some planes in DCS or in contemporary flight sims, which is just like how tourists can miss out seeing a very famous piece of work at a museum. There is more than a 0% chance that some highly sought after planes may simply never get modeled and piloted by us in a digital space. This now brings us to the point of this video, which is Flaming Cliffs 3, the least modeled module in DCS, the one that is not full fidelity, and in my opinion, is the best module in DCS. An unpopular thought but one I would like to unpack with the backdrop of what I just said. If this is your first time here, this channel focuses on multiplayer sim gameplay. So if you're into that, please subscribe. DCS is known for being the most realistic combat flight sim and is sometimes referred as a study sim. If it is or isn't is up to debate and that's beyond the scope of this video. What I would like to focus on is the consumer trend to chase fidelity. Eagle Dynamics leaning more into that direction and the repercussions of that because there are many. I hold the very unpopular opinion that I think full fidelity is a trap from a gameplay perspective. Full fidelity does not really have a clear definition so let's start with that. In my opinion there are two main elements that make a full fidelity module full fidelity. One is the procedural aspect of things, how to use the systems and checklists to make sure you are flying the plane procedurally. The second piece is depth of systems. For example, how accurate and how are things modeled in terms of radar modeling. Notice how this is independent of flight model. You can have a fairly realistic or believable flight model without all the button mashing. You could deploy realistic behaving weapons and have a fairly believable fight without all the clicky clicky baggage. People seem to forget this because of the Flaming Cliffs 3 pack originally had the standard flight model in DCS, but DCS started to upgrade the pack to the advanced flight model and then to the professional flight model, which is used by the full fidelity planes. Again, you can have fairly accurate flight models without the full fidelity systems. DCS is constrained, like all other games, to find the right balance between all the things that can be modeled to make sure their projects come in at budget and in a good timeline. They have to balance graphics, textures, sounds, flight modeling, systems modeling, the environment, gameplay, and this is throttled by the number of aircraft they're tackling. With such a big emphasis on these first few things, DCS is forced to withdraw from the environment, gameplay, and the number of planes. I think this is a mistake, and it looks like we are moving more in this direction of more fidelity. Now this video was introduced with drawing a parallel to museums in DCS, and this was choicefully done. Great pride should be taken in what Eagle Dynamics and the third party module makers are able to do in terms of what they are modeling. It's generally really impressive. Some of the radars, the flight models, the amount of detail they put into the cockpit and such, it's actually pretty insane. But what purpose does it serve? It makes the game feel more like a museum exhibit versus an actual game. I mean, look at what some of the new modules now have. You could take off the compartments, so look at the interiors of the aircraft. This doesn't serve gameplay. This is what museums do when they make cross sections available to see inside vehicles. Think about the DCS gameplay loop right now. A new module gets teased out some new things get modeled that were not modeled in previous modules, which is a watershed moment for the game that another barrier was surpassed. And then what happens? It gets released. We all roll up our sleeves and fumble around with it. We learn how to do things. And then by the time we master it, a new module comes out and we, re we repeat the same loop. We have been caught up in a cycle chasing full fidelity, but look at what we have given up for it. 
There is so much emphasis on fidelity that we are going narrower and deeper on individual planes, and I think that we are focusing on a tree and missing the forest. This game is not DCS, but DCS world. With the current trend that we are on, do you really think the world piece is going to get really fleshed out? The digital cockpit part is for sure, and without a doubt. I like to ground myself in numbers, so let me share something to give a sense of scale. The first mention of the F4U Corsair being confirmed is from December 2015. It is now July 2023. Seven and a half years have gone by. The U.S. involvement in the war in the Pacific started in December 1941 and ended in August 1945. The world could have fought the World War II Pacific conflict two times over and the, Cor and the Corsair and DCS would still not be done. Now let me stop for a second. What I just said is shocking, but it is the truth and let me be very specific in my message here. The point of giving you this scale is not to flame the team involved in this project and it's not to flame ED. M3 is going to deliver the most realistic Corsair ever in history. It will be entirely unmatched and in a way could be argued to be a public service to recreate this plane to be accessible to the general population so they can discover and learn this iconic plane. The issue is, is how the scale of this game is proportioned relative to the resources. In my DCS Module Maker interviews, you heard a lot from different teams, and one of the themes that was shared between all of them is that these third-party module makers are small. They are not huge studios. Some of these people don't even work as module makers full-time. This is their side hustle. This is their passion project, and it is amazing that DCS has carved out an ecosystem that allows for people to make modules to be economically viable. The issue is that what is being made is totally out of sync with the resources. I do not think that it is a good thing that these modules take so long to make. Quantity can be a quality in its own, and at this time I am leaning toward more planes rather than more individually modeled planes. The issue we are facing is not the fault of the module makers. It is not the fault of Eagle Dynamics. It's our fault. How often do you see people complain about IL-2 Great Battles not being playable because it's not clicky clicky? How many people lament the fact that they will never touch Flaming Cliff 3 because it's not full fidelity? People are vocal and loud and they want more fidelity. It's a consumer trend in the space and the companies are reacting, but we are all suffering because of it. We are all collectively getting hung up on fidelity, making planes more realistic, but in turn we make the environment less realistic because it has no scale. Let me say this in a different way. FC3 has eight modules. If you're given a choice between one more full fidelity plane versus one additional FC3 pack, what would you choose? Would you pick one full fidelity plane or eight new FC3 planes? What about two FC3 packs, which would be 16 planes? Would you take 16 mid fidelity modules over one full fidelity module? Think about this question. At what point does the scale of potential flyable new planes outweigh the individual full fidelity one? Let me know in the comments how the formula works out for you. Some of you, it may be higher. You may want 30 plus full fidelity planes to make up for that one full fidelity one. Others may say they will refuse all non full fidelity planes, no matter how many there are. This game is an ambitious project. It's covering a wide era, but has some obvious gaps in what planes are flyable. In short, I would argue that the game could really benefit from a few FC3 style packs to fill out some of the larger gaps. We could even come up with an IL-2 Great Battle style model where less important planes or helicopters are made with mid-fidelity mid quality, i.e. a C-47 for World War II, and then truly iconic planes get a more full fidelity treatment. Or we could have a system where everything comes out as mid-fidelity initially, and then it gets fleshed out over time to become full fidelity. Additionally, on this point, I want to mention that FC3 is old. It's been in the game for a long time. The standards then are not the standards now. There is a mid-road where, if the consumer wanted it, and ED could see it being economically viable, could start to flesh out more mid-fidelity planes that play a give-take on what they model to make sure the planes are interesting, faithful to their performance, and could be turned out in a reasonable time frame. At the end of the day, something has to give. Either more module makers need to come to expand the production capacity, or the fidelity levels have to come down in order to turn things around faster. Ask yourself, if DCS and all the module makers dropped what they were doing and went full bore onto the Pacific, how many years would it take it for them to build out a fleshed out World War II Pacific scenario? It would probably take a decade with how much needs to be made with the current level of fidelity. The Pacific could be faithfully done with a SC3 pack or two in probably, what, half the time? Ask yourself, if you were to remove one DCS module out of the game, which one would negatively impact the game the most? Without hesitation, I would say FC3. 
Imagine DCS without the SU-27. The SU-25A, the MiG-29, etc, etc. This would create a huge gap and it would completely erase a lot of popular scenarios we love and enjoy. My guess is that things covered by state secrets could actually become viable if they were to be modeled out in a SG-3 style way. A lot of servers could still be viable if they took out an F-16 or a Hornet out of their scenario, but some of them could not be the same without the SG-3 planes. What else does SG-3 offer us outside of making important aircraft playable? An accessible way to enter the game that offers a great avenue for new players. One of the most compelling things about SC3. One of the things that never gets mentioned is the great standardization and control setup of the SC3 modules. If you are able to figure out how to bind one, you can bind all of them. Another unpopular thought, but I find this to be really impressive, is taking multiple aircraft, figuring out how they can standardize these different systems against one key mapper is impressive. It's impressive and in some ways out of character for DCS because it's coming at it from a gameplay perspective. Instead of trying to execute a list from a manual, and listing everything out, they looked at all the planes, figured out what was core to the experience, standardized them, and then made it uniform in the key mapper. This is a good thing. And the version of FC3 we are talking about was made forever ago. Imagine what a new modern Flame Eclipse module could be. On a side note, and more of a gut feeling, I would actually argue by having more planes be FC3 style would help the game navigate the future standardization needs that need to happen. One interesting thing that is happening in DCS as of late and it seems to be moving more in this direction, is more radar modeling. The Mirage 2000 really started this, and the F-15 is another one, and it looks like maybe the F-4 may also get this treatment. The Mirage 2000 and the F-15E are a step above most of the radars in the game. They model things like jamming, being visible on the radar, and interference. This is a watershed moment for the game, but it also makes these modules out of step with the older modules. Some of the other modules don't have this model, so they don't see it on their radars. At some point, these things are going to have to be brought to the same standard or these older modules are going to be at a competitive advantage because they are simply under modeled. This is not a good thing because there is a poor level of standardization. Going back to my Corsair example, these studios are small. Making things more standard would most likely allow them to navigate these new watershed moments and they can bring things up to a better standard uniformly. This is my guess. I'm not a module maker, so this is just a thought. In closing, I would like to remind people that the point of this video is not to attack DCS or the third-party module makers. In general, I think they are trying to respond, and in general, they have done a pretty impressive job with that. The point of this video is to show people that the trend is costing us. Our preference and the response from the companies to satisfy that preference is costing us a great deal. So much time and attention is going to modeling things to a full fidelity level, and that leaves a huge gap in the game and DCS is more akin to a museum than a video game in some ways. As someone who's getting older and looking at the timelines and gaps in the game, there are some major gaps that may simply may never get covered because of fidelity requirements. And I think this is a mistake. And this video is an attempt to voice this over and to convince others that there could be maybe a mid road. One last thing that I did not mention it's about modern air combat. I could have mentioned some things about it, but we haven't had a real update about it in a while. So maybe we will get some news on that because I do think that these mid fidelity planes should still be built and I think it'll help cover some gaps in the game. If you reached this part of this video, then maybe I made you think, and maybe you found this video interesting. If you did, please let me know your reaction in the comments below. And if you would like to support, please consider subscribing. Thank you.